Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Patrick Chamberlain. I'm the Director of Artistic Planning for the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra. And it's wonderful to welcome two amazing musicians from the symphony, Assistant Concertmaster David Southern and our Principal Timpanist, Greg La Rosa. Welcome, David and Greg. Thanks for joining us tonight. Of course. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So obviously these past couple of months have been incredibly challenging, scary, weird, interesting times to work in live performance and to be a professional musician. Um, I'd like to hear from each of you what you've been doing and what you've been up to um, during this period and, and, and how you've sort of kept busy, kept musically in shape, kept sane. Um, we'll start with Greg and then David. Um, well, I've been spending a lot of time learning. Um, in normal times, I feel like I normally have too many interests or hobbies and never enough time. So in a way, this has been an opportunity for me to take advantage of sort of a more relaxed schedule, I suppose, and let my curiosities lead. So I've, I love cooking. I've been taking this as an opportunity to dive deeply into new cuisines and techniques. Um, I'm also taking some courses on tax preparation and accounting and bookkeeping, which to some probably sounds like torture, but to me is pretty fascinating. And uh, of course, I've been learning a, a lot of music. I've been spending this time trying to get into the mind of the composers that we normally play, which I found has been equal parts playing, studying, and listening. And that's that thing that during the normal season, there just really isn't the time for. Um, yeah. I, I also have to ask, what's the most interesting thing you've cooked? Um, I've been on a bit of a test kitchen kick with scallops, trying to figure out the best way to sear them, to pan fry them, to grill them, and not a scallop kick. Awesome. Bacon is, is the key. Bacon fat, I found, is the key to the best color. Great. You can cook those for the orchestra anytime. Okay. And David, what about you? What have you been up to? Well, it's been such a long period. I don't even know where to begin. I mean, this, this nightmare has, feels like it's been a year already. It's been half that, I guess, now since all of this started. When, when, it, first, when it first hit in, uh, when was that, early March, we thought it would be maybe a month or two or three, hopefully four. And then now it's, it's six months in and, um, you know, so much has happened. I mean, there was an initial phase of, of shock and, and planning and trying to uh, figure out uh, how to regroup and how to when we could come back together. Um, I'm actually the orchestra committee chair, so I've I've actually been really busy basically ever since March until now um, with orchestra committee meetings and then meeting with uh, with them and with the orchestra and with management team and the board trying to um, figure out how to navigate this crisis um, as best as possible uh, and communicate together. Um, but in terms of my own time I've been um, trying to trying to stay in shape. I've gone through so many different periods of getting inspired by re uh, revisiting Bach and unaccompanied Bach and, and other unaccompanied pieces, trying to find uh, more solo violin repertoire that I either haven't ever played or never have really had the time to explore. Um, and so that, that's been fun and uh, going through different periods like that. I've also gone through phases where violin was the last thing I wanted to to do or, or last thing on my mind and needed to take a little bit of a break and um, played some golf. Uh, I've been in Korea actually for the last couple months with uh, my wife and staying here with her family and um, you know it, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to be here because it it does have a, a little bit more of a semblance of normal as compared to New York. I mean it's, it's been relatively safe and, and you can go out to eat at restaurants and and go out and about. Everybody wears a mask everywhere, but I do feel um, much more secure and safe here. We'll, we'll be coming back shortly. But yeah, I mean, I've, it's, it's, it's hard to sum up what I've done in the last six months, but tried to, trying to stay in shape and also give myself some, some breaks at the same time um, while staying busy with committee work as well. So. Great. And you been um, familiar faces to our audiences on our NJSO at home channel. Um, we've seen a lot of you playing um, solo repertoire, playing together with your colleagues. Um, just curious for each of you what that experience has been like in creating kind of video content, um, much different from the work we normally do on the concert hall stage. Uh, but have you enjoyed that and what have you learned from doing that work? Uh, maybe we'll start with David and then Greg. 
Sure, I've actually had a lot of fun with this. I mean, um, let's see, I've, I've done a few different projects now, probably two or three or maybe even four of them are up on, on, on the Symphony's Facebook and YouTube channels now, um, right from the very beginning, doing a the Ravel duo, a socially distant Ravel duo, uh, first movement with, with Philo, uh, another uh, new hire in the orchestra, uh, cellist, a fantastic cellist, and we had fun putting that together that was right at the beginning of this whole thing back in, I think first week of April, we tried doing that. Um, and we had a lot of fun with that. I've, I've kind of experimented with, with microphones, buying some new mics and camera setup and, and, and editing and, and learning how to use like Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro and all of these different editing tools. And so I've actually learned some new, new skills in the process. Um, I also had some fun with um, flying a drone and getting some beautiful drone uh, videography and, and photos and incorporated that into a couple of my videos as well one of which is already out and there should be another one coming in the next couple of weeks and um, so that's that's been fun for sure and also like I said it's it's given me a chance to stay in shape and uh, to keep making music which is um, in some ways hard to do because you know I never took it for I always took I didn't realize I took my normal work schedule for granted until this pandemic hit. And now I would do anything to just go have rehearsals every day and, and play a concert, no matter where it is, no matter where the run out is, no matter what the time is or what the repertoire is, just to play live music with my colleagues, I would, I would do anything for that. Um, but staying motivated to play solo music has, um, has, been, has been good as well and, and a, a positive thing. And um, being able to share music in a new platform like that has actually been really fun to see and seeing how popular the videos have been from all the that have been shared there's been dozens so far that the njso has shared has been really fun to see um all the great content coming out great and what about you greg well i i second what david was saying about um it, it's it's a really exciting time for me to get to be able to see my colleagues in a different capacity of what you know what we do and and our playing and um so many people that I normally wouldn't get to hear play solo in a in certain contexts, and and an opportunity for me to to demonstrate that too to audience members and other orchestra members. Um, for me, as the timpanist, I'm usually only on stage playing timpani, uh, but this has been an opportunity for me to get to put some uh, some different projects together of me playing percussion with uh, our acting principal percussionist, Jimmy Musto, and um, some other projects too, some solo things I'm working on. Uh, it's been nice to have an excuse to get to play percussion again, um, which I really love. And I um, am always grateful to play timpani, but it's nice to get to revisit the versatile area of uh, percussion. Great. Uh, well, thanks so much for that. Um, David, you alluded a little bit to your role as orchestra committee chair. Um, maybe most of our audiences may not know what that role entails. Could you just talk a little bit about this really crucial, really behind the scenes role um, and, and how, you've, uh, how you've navigated that work over the past couple of months? It's certainly been an interesting time. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, a lot more than I, than I thought I signed up for. Um, you know, a couple of years ago or last year, I've been in this role for two years now. And um, basically as soon as this pandemic hit, it, it's been nonstop work. But traditionally what we do, we have an orchestra committee. Uh, there's five members of the orchestra that are elected every, every fall, beginning of the season. And um, our job is basically to re represent the player's interests, uh, communicate with the union and the union in union's interests and, and uh, communicate with management and, and make sure that there's a, a good working relationship between the, the symphony, the management and, and the staff and the musicians and, and they were all on the same page um, in terms of planning and coordinating the contract and, and, and all kinds of uh, issues that might come up throughout the season. Um, and of course, none of us could have ever anticipated the kind of issues that, that COVID-19 has, has posed to the organization. They've been um, probably unlike anything we faced in our, in our nearly 100 year history now. Um, but these past couple months, specifically, we've we've negotiated a couple what we call side letter agreements to our contract to uh, make some changes because of the, the cancellation of the season in March, and 
we've created special board task forces that, that I've been part of and meeting with the board regularly, probably every two weeks on average through different, different committees, um, safety committees, a strategic plan committee. And so there's really been a really good collaborative effort across the organization of consisting of musicians and not even just in the orchestra committee, but beyond that as well. They've included a lot of musicians, um, the board and, and the staff and management um, to really do everything we possibly can on every front to make sure that um, not only do we survive this period where we're potentially going several months um, into now uh, into potentially January without uh, selling one ticket um, or playing for one live audience. Uh, and how do we, how do we, how do we cope with that? How do we deal with that? And we're trying to figure out how to pivot and how to make this um, uh, an opportunity in a way to kind of reinvent ourselves and to make sure that we're uh, doing everything we can to make sure that the NJSO comes through this strong. And I think we're, we're, we've been proving ourselves um, capable of, of that and um, doing, and through, through all this, these types of uh, videos right here that you're seeing on the NJSO at home pages uh, through Facebook and YouTube. Um, that's, this is just a small part of everything that we're doing. There's a lot behind the scenes as well. And, and I think, um, you know, when we do come back, uh, to a live audience, hopefully everybody will be, um, hopefully our audience will be more, uh, enthused to see us than ever before. Uh, and I know we'll be more excited to play for them. And on top of that, we'll have, um, uh, I think more content and more skills as an organization because of what we've gone through. So. But um, in terms of the role as orchestra committee chair, it's, as you can imagine, it's been basically on average three to four meetings a week be between just me and the orchestra committee or with management or with the board. It's, it's um, been a lot of work. Um, and, um, and, you know, honestly, I kind of in some ways enjoy it because it keeps me busy and keeps me uh, motivated and something to wake up to and to do every single day and to think about um, and keeps me feeling like I have, um, work <laughs> even if it's not paid so um it's it's been it's been a challenging time but um i feel hopeful so well thank you for your leadership um on behalf of everyone in the organization um uh, you're both relatively new additions to the symphony roster um david you're i guess concluding your fourth season and greg um your first with the symphony um what does it mean to each of you to join an organization like this with a 100 year history um, and to be kind of the next generation carrying on the traditions of the symphony? Um, we'll start with Greg and then David. Well, I think that there's a lot of responsibility that comes with this of, uh, of having to sort of learn the ropes and make sure that we carry on the tradition while um, still being true to our own artistic vision and um, and how we would like to see the next hundred years of the symphony play out. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a more welcoming group of musicians and staff and board members to help sort of this transition of joining the orchestra and uh, especially in a tumultuous year like this. Um, I, I am extremely grateful for everybody's uh, experience in, in dealing with all sorts of musical and non-musical uh, issues and experiences that this organization has uh, gone through. And um, it's also an exciting time for me to be able to start learning a lot about how this specific orchestra plays certain repertoire, um, how individual musicians play together or sections play together. Uh, there's so much to learn from that perspective that you can only learn on the job in the seat behind the drums or holding your instrument, whatever instrument that is. Uh, it's a really exciting opportunity to get to learn all of these and, and to be with such a welcoming group who uh, understands that you are learning and that, um, that you're gaining experience uh, from the sort of collective experience that everybody has had as well. Great. And David, you've been here a little longer than Greg, but still uh, relatively new in the life of the orchestra. So what about, what about you? How has your experience been? Uh, it's been great. You know, I, I officially started um, with Shen, although I played, I think, two concerts with the previous music director, uh, Jacques Lacombe. Um, so my, basically my entire experience has been um, 
with, with, with Shen Zhang, our wonderful music director, and of course, all the, the wonderful guest conductors we have as well. Um, but no, I really love, I love playing with the New Jersey Symphony for, for a number of reasons. I mean, as uh, Greg alluded to, um, um, you know, there's a lot of experience in this orchestra and, and somewhat decades of experience. And, um, you know, it's, it's really fun hearing stories from, from my colleagues of, of wonderful performances they've done in the past with, with different uh, past music directors of, of certain repertoire. And, and, you know, there is some built in performance practice a little bit, but I feel like there's enough uh, new members and with a, with a new music director with a totally different take, you don't really probably, I, I of, of course don't pick up on that. They may sense that, that, um, that a little bit, but, um, but I think because of the richness of the experience in the orchestra, um, it, it, what, what, what am I trying to say? It does add a lot to the interpretation of a lot of the, the, the master works that we play, like pieces like um, the Smetana that we're about to, to listen to. It's actually the first time I ever played the piece. It, surprisingly, it's actually a, um, a, one of his most popular um, pieces, but I had, I had never had the chance to play it. But many people in the orchestra had actually played it several times um, with pre pre previous music directors. And um, yeah, there's a certain sense of freedom I get from playing with the New, Jer New Jersey Symphony. Uh, which I love, and there's there's kind of no holding back. Uh, the approach that I get from from Shen is that uh, you can kind of go all in. It's it's pure joy and excitement that I get from her, and so I never feel like I'm on my toes or I have to be careful um, to not uh, offend some type of um, set tradition or set way of playing things. It's it's a yeah, it's a it's been a great experience overall. I think. Wonderful. Well, tonight we're going to listen to three concert openers, um, three pieces that began programs, Beethoven's Coriolan Overture, which dates from November of 2017, and then two performances that are from this past season, um, the Moldau from Smetna's Mavlast, which came from a January 2020 performance, and Rimsky-Korsakov's Capriccio Espanol, which came from a November 2019 performance, all with Shen Zhang conducting. So Greg and then David, uh, what makes for a good concert opener? Uh, what do you what do you love in the first piece you play on a program? And what are some of the different roles that a concert opener can play in setting the tone for a program? Sure, I think that the most successful concert op openers are usually short and sweet. Don't necessarily need to be, but um, in my experience, uh, the the biggest benefit of a concert opener is to sort of light and enthusiasm in the orchestra and in the audience uh, and uh, allow the orchestra to sort of set the stage for what the rest of the program is, is going to hold. Um, in this case, the, this program of all openers is really interesting uh, because they do actually build upon each other, I feel, at least in the way that in the, the, the programmed here with the Beethoven and the Smetna and then the Rimsky-Korsakov, um, and, and in a way right now, uh, it's a particularly unique program because they're so programmatic in the way that we can't travel right now, but listening to this program, I'm sure everybody in the audience is going to feel like they've just taken a journey across Europe uh, in the next hour or so. Excellent. And what about you, David? What makes a good opener? Um... I totally agree with Greg, of course. Um, all of that um, about it being short and sweet is, is oftentimes a great way to start a program. Something that grabs the, the audience's attention right away. You don't want to lose them in the opener. Um, that would be unfortunate and then it can be hard to get them back. Um, so having a piece of music that um, yeah, has a little bit of excitement, a little bit of um, you know, some beautiful melodies, some, some virtuosic playing, all of the above. Um, something to, to really get, um, get people drawn into what we're, what we're about to, to share with them uh, throughout the rest of the concert. Uh, because if it's not something exciting, it's, it's kind of hard to keep them, keep them there. Um, you don't want to start with something <laughs> slow and boring. Um, that's not the, the way we usually do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, are we going to, are you going to ask more specific questions about the pieces or do you want me to? I, I am. Well, or we can jump in right now. Um, I mean, of these three openers, um, yeah. 
the Beethoven Coriolan Overture, the Moldau from uh, Vlast, and Rimsky Korsakovsky for Charles Um What are you listening for, and what is what do you what do you love about each of these pieces? Um, what do you think they do, and how do you think they fulfill the role of a concert opener? And maybe David and then Greg can take that. Oh man, oh, it's a lot of sorry. That's a lot. Yeah, there's so much. Um, what's wonderful about these? You know, it's been really fun. I must say, going back uh, right before we did this. Uh, this interview, I decided to go back and listen to them again. And boy, did it bring back incredible memories. I got goosebumps when I first started listening because I'd actually gone quite a long time without listening to those pieces as well as to a lot of symphonic music. And, and you know, I just immediately remembered what it felt like to be on stage with my colleagues playing these pieces and how much joy it was. Um, and, you know, like for instance, the Moldo, which like I said, I'd never played before, um, you know, there's so there's so much to that piece. It's it's only like a what ten to thirteen minute yeah. piece or something like that. Well, yeah, it's like yeah. short opener. But there's so much in it. It's in, I I read a little bit about it as well, and you know it's obviously about a river going through the Czech Republic and and all these different scenes that that the river comes to in its passage. Um, and one of my favorite moments is when it comes across um, this wedding. It's like a peasant wedding. I think is like the the title because there's like uh, like Greg said, it's uh, programmatic music, and and so every section of the piece has a has a title to it. Um, so at one point it might be that we're going, um, you know, through passing by some jubilant hunters, and then uh, going through a wedding, and then through a village, and 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 you hear you can really hear that in the music, and and uh, the yeah the Smetna in particular, I think brings out so much. Um, so much of the best in JSO qualities in terms of we get to do everything in that. We get to show off lush, beautiful singing melodies. Um, the horns get some great, beautiful moments. We get some virtuosic stuff at the end um, that gets pretty wild, actually, and intense and, and very, very tricky, um, technically. Um, but like I said, probably my favorite moment is this incredibly charming moment uh, about three or four minutes in when you get to that wedding and it's this little poco rhythm and it's just absolutely pure joy. Um, probably impossible to not have a smile on your face when you listen to it. Um, so for me, that's, um, that's a great opener. It ends, it ends jubilantly uh, with a big, loud, huge two chord cadence. Um, the Beethoven is, it's, um, I mean, it's Beethoven. It's incredible music. It's, um, it's intense, it's dramatic, but then it has this, incredibly beautiful uh and uh how do i describe it um much more sweet melody that comes out seems seemingly comes out of nowhere like he turns this corner all of a sudden and you're in this and you're and you get this little four bar phrase that's one of the most beautiful melodies you ever heard and the way he starts it is so dramatic and so dark and so turbulent um that it kind of comes out of left field and then all of a sudden it's like oh where did this come from um and also once again within like 10 to 13 minutes however long this piece is there's so much in there there's so much drama there's so many different characters so many different so much so much in it and it's actually also programmatic in, in many ways because it's based off of off of the play um Cor Coriola Coriolana wait how do you say it Coriolanus. Coriolanus. thank you Coriolanus and um and Beethoven's not really known for his programmatic music but you can really hear it in that piece in particular um, and then very quickly, sorry, I'm going on and on, but about the Rimsky, the Kors Rimsky Korsakov, um, um, also a great one for the NJSO because you get the chance to have basically every instrumental section of the orchestra show off. It's um, when when he first started writing it, he was thinking of making it mainly for solo violin, and then he decided to like give the solos to everybody. You, you'll hear, um, you know, clarinet, trumpets, horns, every uh, harp. Um, there's so many different. Uh, solo moments throughout the orchestra. It's beautifully orchestrated um, and uh, has all kinds of cool, fun effects. There's a, there's a quasi guitar section, like where, where all the violins, if you, if you could see us, we're all plucking our instruments like a guitar. You'll hear that in there. Um, harmonics, different techniques that you don't, you hear all the techniques in that one piece. Um, and like I said, lots of beautiful, uh, fun solos and um, uh, yeah. It's, it's, and also a thrilling finish. It's, it's the kind of piece that um, starts with a lot of flair 
and um, and ends with a lot of flair. And I think um, nobody will fall asleep during it. It's a uh, there is a there is a beautiful slow slow movement in the middle, um, but it's um, beautiful and luscious um, and uh, and sweet and uh, it's a it's a great opening piece. A little bit longer than the other two, but uh, not by much. So, yeah. and Greg, what are you looking forward to hearing and listening to? Or what are your favorite moments in some of these works? Yeah, I think that um, when I'm listening to each of these these pieces, uh, I'm listening mostly for the way the composer is sort of tricking our expectations in different ways. Um, so for instance, in the Beethoven, uh, David alluded to sort of these two identities that we hear and, and how they are at odds with each other, it's sort of in line with um, the drama that is, that is based off of. Um, and I'm no music historian, but I feel like, and maybe Patrick, this is a question to come back to you, that Beethoven is the first, uh, first composer in, in my understanding that the idea of an overture becomes less tied to the opera and the drama, um, yes. becomes sort of as like a standalone individualized piece, like the rest of the pieces on the program, the Smetna and the Rimsky-Korsakov. Yeah, you're exactly right about that. Yeah, first, you know, he's plenty of these overtures as an opening work that have nothing to do with scenic drama, like the Consecration of the House Overture, a piece written for, you know, the opening of a theater. Um, you know, even uh, while Coriolan is a dramatic overture based on a drama, it, it isn't necessarily meant to be played before the play. It's just a piece of music that kind of encapsulates the themes and ideas behind the drama. Of course, Beethoven also did write program music, like his incidental music for the play Egmont, or an overture to his ballet, The Creatures of Prometheus. But you're exactly right. This is a kind of new uncharted territory of the overture as its own musical idea. I, I find that really interesting. And, and it's, it's particularly fitting that I think it's first on tonight's program too, correct? So Yes. And of course, um, we're celebrating the 250th anniversary of Beethoven in the year 2020. And while many of our performances, uh, unfortunately, um, have been canceled or will be postponed. Um, it's great to kind of honor that tradition with uh, tonight's performance. And and when I'm listening to uh, Capriccio Espanol, I'm I'm also thinking about those expectations. I think um, Rimsky Korsakov is known for being an unbelievable orchestrator, but I don't think he gets quite as much uh, praise for his ability to pace uh, a piece. And so there's so many moments in this music when I'm thinking, well, have I heard that before? Like, I, yeah. I think I, I must have heard that before. And, and that's because somewhere deep in the harmony or some line that we're not thinking of, uh, our ears are being primed with the next tune that's about to come up. And so there's this sort of rolling feeling of like everything is happening exactly in the order in which it ought to, even though even if you're, it's the first time that you're hearing the piece, you might feel like, oh, I could hum this. Like, I know exactly what's gonna happen. And that's just, that's fascinating to me. I think that's a real art. Great. Well, we're, uh, I think we probably ought to get to listening to this music tonight. And it's been really wonderful to hear both of your perspectives on this music and a little bit about what each of you have been doing um, during this time of COVID. I know on behalf of all of us at the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra, we cannot wait get back on stage and make music for you, our audience. Um, but until we can do that, we hope that these virtual events um, provide that similar level of connection and engagement with us and our musicianship, our musicians, of course. Um, so stay tuned. In the comments, Greg, David, and myself will provide real-time commentary on what we're hearing and experiencing, uh, our own reflections on, on this music and these wonderful performances. Uh, so stay tuned. Feel free to ask us questions uh, if there's something you're curious about. We'll do our best to answer. And in the meantime, enjoy this wonderful performance. And thanks so much to Greg and David for joining us this evening.
Thank you again for joining us for tonight's broadcast and chat. And thanks especially to NJSO musicians, our assistant concertmaster, David Southern, and our principal timpanist, Greg La Rosa, for their engaging commentary and insight into the music you just heard. As a reminder, the NJSO is your statewide orchestra. Please consider making a gift today at support.njsymphony.org so that we can continue to bring you innovative musical programming like the event you just experienced. All donations made between now and August 31 will be matched up to $75,000, one-to-one, thanks to a generous challenge grant from NJSO board chair, Norman Slonaker. Thanks again for joining us this evening. I'm looking forward to seeing you next time.